Good morning. Welcome to see everybody. Oh, it's great to see all you students here today. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Harrisburg. Welcome students. Yes, great to see people. <laughs> Everybody's waving. <laughs> A lot of beautiful faces. Oh, look at you. Oh, so many special guests. We have, we have three minutes until the meeting starts. Would it be unpresidential for me to share one of those bad jokes that I'm known for? <laughs> yeah, yes, I think that would probably be consistent with unpresidential. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be both consistent and unpresidential. <laughs> so was that a yes or? Okay. Sure, we'll, we'll, go for it, James. We should tell the joke. We should tell the About joke. Two minutes. <laughs> um, an egg went walking into a bar and looked around and the place was empty. The egg said to the bartender, it looks like I beat everyone here. The bartender <laughs> oh said, my goodness. Not really. The chicken came first. <laughs> <laughs> Farm joke. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> They, they did vote, you know, to have me become the president. And I've been doing things like this to lobby to, uh, you know, how do you get out of that job, right? And <laughs> this, it just seems like the more of that that I do, the more support there is. And, and so uh, we just... <laughs> James, we love you and the jokes. We love you and the jokes. Rotarians are just great, amazing people like that. That's right. I wish we had the thumbs up, thumbs down. We could <laughs> see what the students thought. <laughs> oh, thumbs you do. Up. Yeah, How there's a thumbs there up. Is. I like it. Thank you. Thank you so there much. <laughs> We're getting a couple thumbs ups. That's right. We'll do it. Somebody's laughing like crazy. I got I thumbs it. down. I love you guys. I love you guys. Thank you. Just made my day. <laughs> oh my goodness. People are listening. Welcome, Rotarians. That's right. Welcome, Rotarians. <laughs> It's 11.59 and it is Monday. Can you believe it's December already? How many people are thinking, man, where did this year go? Unbelievable. It's so good to have everyone here uh, with us today at the Rotary Club of Harrisburg weekly meeting today, Monday, December 7th. We are clearly on a Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, just remember at the top right-hand side of your, of your um, screen, you will see all the Zoom controls. So if you'd, like to, if you'd like to focus in on the speaker and tune everyone else out, that's where you do it. And as the meeting goes along, be sure to use the chat function with any questions that you might have uh, for the panel later in the meeting, or just to say hi to everyone as well. Let's get our meeting started. We actually open our meeting today acknowledging um, the loss of a uh, fellow Rotarian, Dr. John Judson, uh, passed away Sunday a week ago. And before we do anything else in our meeting today, I'd just like to take 30 seconds uh, for a moment of silence as we, um, as we remember John. Okay, let's do an invocation. Uh, Vlad, if you could uh, do our invocation, please. Amen, let's bow. First in uh, continuing to remember 
our beloved Dr. John Judson, such a great humanitarian and the epitome of a Rotarian. He lived his life as a Rotarian in service of others. And for me, he was a special guy because he loved passionately the country where I was born, Haiti. And that holds a special place in my heart. I wish I could have gotten to know Dr. John better, but he will be sorely and truly missed and not soon forgotten. And now, Father, as we come before you, thanking you for Again, another day that you've made that was not promised to us. We ask for your healing. We ask for your touch. We ask for your blessings. Father, we thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, and Lord, what you're going to do. We ask and lift up our country before you, Lord, our leaders before you, each and every person here on this call, and all the families represented here. We thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do. And it's in your precious name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vlad. Join me, if you could, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And the rotary four-way test uh, of all the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? Is it the truth? Second, is it fair, is it to, fair all to all concerned? concerned? Third, will it build will goodwill, build goodwill and, better and better friendships? friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial, it be beneficial to all concerned? concerned? Let's keep the rotary four-way test front and center in all that we do throughout our weeks. Just a couple of quick announcements because we have a crammed uh, agenda today. Joy to the Berg is out and running. Um, and uh, just because of the COVID world that we live in, we really wanna give this a push. I think there are some good uh, sales going on already, but uh, we'd, like to, we'd like to see if we can clear a thousand or 1200 copies sold. So remember, pass the word on to family and friends, give the CD as a gift this holiday season. And remember that all proceeds from this project are benefiting homeless initiatives here in the Harrisburg area. Lunch money today is being donated to the Jewish Community Foundation of Central Pennsylvania uh, for their Food for Children campaign. If you'd like to donate um, more, or if your lunch money is not included in your dues, then uh, head on out to pajewishendowment.org, click on the donate button, and you can make an additional financial contribution there. And last but not least, thank you to everyone. You know, Rotarians getting together and doing service above self is what makes so many things happen in our world today. We thank our corporate members for their ongoing financial support. Your support really makes it possible for us to carry out the many humanitarian projects and initiatives that we do throughout each and every Rotary year. And now to our program. Today's program has been a long time coming. We've been talking about it for a couple of months. Originally, the meeting and the program was scheduled to take place in March of 2019. We had planned to watch the film Expedition Chesapeake and hold a panel discussion at the Whitaker Center. And then along came COVID and we had to sort of change all of our plans. But you know, there turned out to be I, and something that I think is a real testament to all of the people involved and our program committee, especially that instead of 160 people seeing this film as originally scheduled, 
nearly 700 people have watched the film so far. So we've got nearly four times, let's give it up for our program committee, um, nearly four times the original impact. And with that, I'd like to turn our meeting over to John Moorfield from our program committee. Thanks, James. You know, 100 years from now, uh, the beauty of the Susquehanna River and the various rivers uh, that feed into the Chesapeake uh, Bay will continue to dominate the region, uh, its geography, and certainly contribute to its economy. While we may not have individually held a hellbender, a salamander, or seen a river otter, we all know, uh, as you know from the movie, that the bay and the river is alive. With, the, with care, our grandchildren and perhaps our great-grandchildren will be able to enjoy it uh, as much as we do. Uh, before I introduce the panelists and our moderator, I uh, certainly want to make a special note to the uh, schools and organizations that are attending today's meeting. Honestly, as uh, uh, part of the program uh, with 700 individuals attending uh, beyond Harrisburg and Keystone Rotary, uh, it's a real pleasure to include uh, all of them into the meeting. Uh, certainly from uh, Steel High, uh, all of the middle school and all of the high school are attending. And uh, for those uh, that were a member and or uh, cheering on the state championship football team, uh, congrats on your uh, win last week. Uh, from the Harrisburg School District, uh, the middle school uh, program at uh, the Nativity School, uh, as well as uh, various uh, classes within SciTech High are uh, participating. We're also pleased to have uh, St. Stephen's uh, uh, School and uh, their entire program join along with various residents of the Harristown community. It's uh, my distinct honor to uh, introduce our moderator, Alicia Richards, and uh, the panelists, the various panelists for uh, today's uh, further discussion and insight in the movie, but more importantly on the role of the Chesapeake uh, watershed in the Bay plays. I, I'm sure that you will uh, find the panel discussion will be well served with Alicia Richards' uh, great regional insight. Uh, joining uh, WHTM nearly uh, 30 years ago, Alicia has demonstrated success at many levels as a servant leader uh, to the community and uh, as a friend uh, has been a wonderful one. As a panelist, I'm also pleased to introduce the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Secretary, uh, Cindy Dunn uh, to the panel. With a lifetime of a, uh, conservation achievement, uh, both through the Pennsylvania State Government uh, and uh, previously uh, the Audio Audubon Society, Secretary, Secretary Dunn is uniquely uh, qualified uh, to discuss the Chesapeake's role. Uh, so much so that several years ago, uh, she was she received the Chesapeake Bay's Environmental Leadership Award. Uh, so we're glad to have Cindy uh, participate. Uh, no stranger to the importance of the Chesapeake watershed to agriculture, I'm also pleased to introduce Joel Rotz. After spending uh, the first half of his career as a farmer uh, and leading uh, farming, uh, a family business in farming, uh, Joel joined uh, the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau to lead the Farm Bureau's government affairs uh, team. Finally, uh, I'm pleased to introduce my friend and great friend of Harrisburg Rotary and former member, uh, Dr. Michael Haynes. Mike served as the uh, chief executive officer for the Whitaker Center for approximately 10 years at uh, uh, the, the last stage of his professional career. Uh, he then started the notion of producing uh, the movie, which uh, you've seen. He decided uh, uh, to serve uh, as the executive producer of the movie and put it all together. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the meat of the panel discussion, I asked Mike to provide a bit of a back, back of the, uh, behind the uh, movie 
uh, sense of what, what was going on and uh, what was left on the table uh, for consideration. So uh, turning it over to Mike. Well, thank you, John. Um, can you hear me okay? Sure. Good, thank you. Thank you for uh, putting this all together, John. Uh, it, it's really been special to see uh, some friends of Rotary and Rotary friends, and also uh, a special welcome to all the students. Uh, this film was made for you. And I'm so pleased that so many students have been able to see the film. Uh, some of you in Rotary may remember that in August of 2017, I was invited to come to Rotary and speak about the plans to produce this film. Uh, at that point, we had not really secured all the funding for the film, but we had great hopes. And uh, I remember a club member asking me, uh, well, what is this film gonna cost? And how much of that money have you actually raised? Well, um, when I answered that the film was gonna cost about 2.8 million, and we'd raised only about half of that, uh, I think I heard someone from the back of the room quietly say, good luck. Well, I'm pleased to report that we did have some very good fortune along the way, but in truth, it took writing dozens of proposals, making countless presentations, and an endless number of email notes and telephone calls and direct contact with nearly 100 individuals to secure the $2.8 million. And the board of directors of Whitaker Center Productions made the decision to move forward with producing the film in October 2017. And a month later, we signed a production contract. Filming began in March 2018 and was completed in October. Post-production began in November of 2018 and the film was completed and premiered in March of 2019. The production involved 60 days of filming and it was virtually all outdoors. The film crew traveled over 12,000 miles in the watershed and throughout the bay. And we're grateful to the help of more than 135 individuals who played a role in producing this film. Uh, if Adeline, you'd pull up the PowerPoint presentation. I'd like to share with you some of the photos we captured during the production. Now, I think it's important that I point out that most of the photos that I will share with you were taken with a rather, rather ordinary camera, not the 8K digital cameras we used to shoot the film. So they may not be quite as sharp as the film. Our overall goal was to communicate the importance of a healthy watershed as essential for a healthy estuary. We are telling the story through iconic species and a selected group of scientists who devoted their careers to understanding, nurturing, and sustaining these species. The next slide indicates that we began in the wilderness watershed, only a few miles from Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, on Pine Creek in Pennsylvania Little Grand Canyon, with the story of the recovery of river otters. To the next slide, please. This is some of the natural beauty that you can find in this massive watershed of 64,000 square miles that we feature in this film. Next slide, please. Jeff Corwin is accompanying Dr. Tom Surface on a search for river otters. Dr. Surface began introducing river otters in this region when he was a graduate student at Penn State in the early 1980s. At that time, there were no river otters left in the Little Grand Canyon. And Dr. Surface was one of the first people to work on reintroducing them to this region. Next slide, please. We were fortunate to recruit to the production team, the leading cinematographer in giant screen films, James Nyhouse. James is so well known in the industry that anyone who wants the best advice on cinematography for the giant screen Call, they will call James. James Neely is kneeling on a rock in the river and filming Jeff and Dr. Surface as they pass by in their raft. Next slide, please. We move on to the Goodwin Islands. From the northern portion of the watershed, we traveled to the southern end of the Chesapeake 
to film blue crab living in the shallow waters around Goodwin Islands. Next slide, please. Our days typically began around 6 a.m. and involved loading the camera boat with all the equipment that we would need for a day of filming on the water. Next slide, please. Dr. Ram Lipschitz and Dr. Rochelle Seitz are the featured scientists in the segment fo focusing on oysters and blue crab. They are both research faculty at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and began their research studies well over 30 years ago. Next slide, please. Our production team did a fantastic job cash capturing the fascinating footage of the scientists engaged in their research on the water. As you can imagine, this is a little tricky when you have two boats on the water, both moving with the waves and the, and the motion of the water and trying to uh, capture a still photo or a still film footage. Next slide, please. Our next stop on our journey was the James River in Virginia, where we visited with Dr. Brian Watts. Brian is the director of the Center for Conservation Biology at William and Mary University. Dr. Watts is internationally known for his work with endangered bird species. When I asked him when he began working with birds, he said, well, it was when I was 12 years old and I've been working with birds ever since then and he's now uh, in his early 60s. Right. Dr. Watts is climbing up a navigation marker to retrieve a young osprey from a, a large nest there. Next slide, please. The crane with one of our 8K cameras mounted at the end of a 24 foot boom was essential to get close up shots of the nest and Dr. Watts interac interaction with the birds. Next slide, please. Dr. Watts is holding and calming a young, young osprey before he lowers it to the boat where they will install, well, they will place an identification band on the young bird. The osprey is another remarkable story of recovery that we felt was essential to include in the film. And if you've seen the film, you may have noticed that Dr. Watts during that scene uh, briefly glanced up to the sky well, he was keeping an eye on the mother osprey. She was circling the nest. She wasn't very happy that, um, to see a human in the nest with her young. In this slide, Jeff Corwin and Dr. Watts are attaching the, the band to the bird. Now, wherever this bird goes, it will be easily identified as a Chesapeake Bay osprey, something that's critical to the future research related to the osprey. Next shot, please. We also visited Wachapreek, Virginia. Wachapreek is uh, population 224. We were there because the most pristine oyster reefs on the east coast of the United States are located just northeast of this tiny village. This is one of the sev sev several shots that we took with drones throughout the film. Next shot, please. The aerial photo reflects the expanse of the oyster reefs in this state protected area. It's truly a remarkable place. Next shot, please. The area is critical for research on ways oyster reefs are formed in a natural environment. The research findings are instructive in efforts to support increased reef formation in the bay. Next, please. During the course of this project, we encountered a number of folks who volunteered their time and resources to help us with the film. For example, the owners of this 52-foot sailboat allowed us to spend a day on the bay with them to capture footage for the film. Next, please. This is Greg McCoskey, the film's director, shooting with one of our 8K cameras from the bow of the boat. You can see the Bay Bridge in the background. Next, please. And this is one of the lighthouses in the bay that we were able to capture on film. Next, please. One of our many partners in creating the film was the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewater, Maryland. The center's director, Dr. Anson Hines, is being wired for sound in this photo. He has been conducting research on blue crabs in the bay for the last 40 years and is internationally known as the expert on the blue crab. Next, please. The Smithsonian provided us with a total of four boats including this barge that served as our equipment boat. 
Next, please. The Smithsonian also provided this specially equipped workbook at no cost to our project. In addition, they also provided four staff to assist us during our time at the research center. Next, please. We decided that we needed to feature an iconic vessel for our epic journey. And we were pleased to find this 110 foot, three masted schooner known as Alliance. This shot is from the opening scene of the film and that's Jeff Corwin on the bowsprit. Next, please. We spent over five hours filming the Alliance in the open waters of the bay. And we captured some amazing shots, particularly at the end of the day when this shot was taken. Next, please. I hope these photos give you a glimpse behind the scenes of creating this remarkable film. Next, please. Fascinating animal species, preeminent scientists, and breathtaking cinematography of the watershed in the bay are all hallmarks of the film. And now back to me, please, if possible. <laughs> Thanks to John, again, for organizing the panel discussion and arranging for all of you to see the film. As in indicated in the film credits, a number of sponsors and granting agencies supported the production, but I want to especially recognize the Dauphin County Commissioners, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and with special thanks to Secretary Dunn. All of them supported the project early in its planning phase, as well as throughout the production phase of the project. Also, the support of Pennsylvania American Water, the presenting sponsor, was critical to the project. Finally, I'm grateful to the founding members of the Board of Directors of Whitaker Center Productions, Mary Weber Weston, Kristen Olwine Milkey, and Mark Caldwell, who worked with me over the eight years it took to develop, fund, and produce the film. I thank you for your interest in this and the importance of fresh water and a healthy Chesapeake Bay. Now I believe it's Time for Joel Rotz to say a few words. Thank you, Mike, Michael, and uh, I am Joel Rotz with the Farm Bureau. I'm just going to talk very briefly about why farmers are involved and should care uh, about this wonderful watershed we all live in. I think the film just does such an excellent job of, of showing how we all impact um, this watershed as we go about our daily lives working here and living here. And certainly farmers uh, have opportunity to have a huge impact. Uh, we have 30,000 farms in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, over 3 million acres of ground that the farmers grow their crops on and raise their animals on. And of course, everything we do in this watershed, particularly as it comes to uh, putting nutrients uh, in our soil and disturbing the soil provides opportunity for those nutrients to, to get into the watershed and not stay in the fields uh, where the crops need them. Farmers have been working at improving the Chesapeake Bay watershed for more than three decades now. Um, and, and the film, I think, does a great job of highlighting the improvements that we, we've been able to accomplish. Uh, but the fact is, uh, we still have a long ways to go uh, to, to reach uh, the water quality levels that, that uh, are needed uh, to really bring the bay back to, to you know, what, it's been, what it was historically before uh, man had a footprint on it. So um, while I think we're doing a lot of improvements, uh, some of those improvements, you know, we're, we've not seen the effects of because we continue to deal with with, uh, I call it our past sins in agriculture. You know, there was a time when the right thing to do to farm was to plow the soil and turn all the weeds and growth under the soil so that the farmer could plant his crop and grow foods that you know, we all eat, need to eat. Uh, but uh, we've come to learn that there are much better ways to farm now and to help preserve uh, those nutrients and that sediment and keep it on the farms where it's needed. Uh, however, I, what I was leading up to is 
those practices of the past are still haunting us because that sediment that came off of those fields still sits in the stream banks and the stream beds and behind dams. Um, and when we have a good flood of rain, uh, we still get the sediment and nutrient loading coming down to the bay. So again, we can't lose sight of, of the progress we've made, but we also need to continue to meet the challenges that are out there to preserve uh, the bay and, and the watershed. So again, I'm, I'm really happy the film highlights the progress and yet acknowledges challenges uh, that we still face. And I'll look forward to having an opportunity to talk a little more about those as, as we move forward here. And I believe I now have the privilege of turning it over to Secretary Dunn of BCNR, whom I've known a long time, and when we both played very different roles than we play today. So, Cindy, right. take it away. Thanks, Joel. Thanks. Good to see you and good to see everybody. Joel and I have been working together on uh, Chesapeake Bay for probably 25 years in different roles and responsibilities. When I first met Joel, he was a Franklin County farmer and uh, leading the way on some of those good practices he was talking about. Just want to uh, thank the farmers. You know, throughout this pandemic, they've kept our food supply secure, and it's been a remarkable feat considering all the changes that have uh, come upon us since the pandemic hit, you know, the changes in the way food supplied and delivered to people. So thanks and hats off to the farmers. And uh, I think they're fully um, capable of the uh, challenge ahead of them. We at DCNR work with uh, many partners, other state agencies, federal agencies, counties, and uh, many local partners, including citizens and communities uh, there was a big effort underway for Pennsylvania to meet what's called a pollution diet. It's required uh, because of the pollution to the bay, but a lot of us are in it because we see the benefits uh, to Pennsylvania. I was excited to see uh, Michael's um, slides uh, of the otters and re be reminded of the great critters out there like the hellbender. And... Um, it reminds me why we're really doing this it, to clean up our waterways and water is essential to life. It's the most essential ingredient to life and um, our waterways in Pennsylvania need some help and, and the runoff is not just from farms it's from people's backyards and parking lots and all the pavement we create all the practice that we have. So there's a there's a place for everybody in the cleanup but just as important as doing your part to uh, clean up is getting to know the, the creeks and the rivers and the public lands of Pennsylvania. Because when you get to know these close and personal, and when you uh, get to see an otter or an osprey or another bird or another interesting uh, creature, that's the biggest motivation uh, ever to clean, clean these waterways up. One thing we're doing at DCNR that's really uh, helping the effort, we're helping to plant trees by streams. There's no better place to plant a tree than right by a stream. Many of you, uh, many of the students here have done uh, tree planting projects. I'm sure I know the Rotary has. But if you uh, put a buffer between uh, land and water, it, it cleanses the water. That same buffer of trees will shade the stream. Things like the hellbender need uh, cool, cool water. And it's important that the water stay cooler with the changing climate we have. And it helps filter and clean up the waterways. So, uh, you know, for the students, if you're ever invited, if your class uh, participates in a riparian, what they call riparian, riparian just means streamside, forested buffer planting, that's a direct way you can uh, be active and cleaning up a stream. Incidentally, a tree planted almost anywhere helps reduce pollution. It sequesters, it captures carbon, it cleans the air and cleans the water. But um, special message to the student, I hope some of you take me up on this. If you, uh, in the chat box, if you could write down uh, some of the parks you've been to. Pennsylvania has 121 state parks. Dauphin County has, I think, seven or eight county parks. Local municipalities have parks. Uh, City of Harrisburg has a great system of public parks and they have the great uh, waterfront park along the Susquehanna River. Just write down some of the places you've been on public lands because public lands are a wonderful place to learn about uh, nature, to observe nature, and to have firsthand experience. You'd be uh, incredibly lucky to see um, a hellbender. You won't, you won't see one right there in the Susquehanna, 
However, I was uh, I was canoeing down by three mile one time and saw its close relative, the mud puppy. It looks a lot like a hellbender. So you've got to get out there though to see this stuff. And it's uh, really, I see someone's been to Swatara State Park, great. There are uh, a lot of good, a uh, lot of good critters there. Wildwood Park's a wonder. Someone put uh, Wildwood Park. Wildwood, uh, you know what? I'd recommend that if you haven't been there, the birding is phenomenal. There are turtles in the canal. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Baltimore Orioles, all kinds of things. Yeah, Bellevue Park is another great place to see birds, including a rare bird. Cadors, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of good uh, visitation. So I think the first thing to do is like, when you leave today's meeting, decide to learn a little more about nature because over the years and the decades, you know, that'll, that'll motivate you to really get connected and do your share. I wanna point out it was students that petitioned our legislature to get the hellbender named as a state's amphibian. And uh, we at DCNR coordinate the biodiversity of the state. We were pretty excited that number one, we have a state amphibian. <laughs> and number two, it's a hellbender, two, a two foot long amphibian, pretty amazing. Um, and so it's, you, know, you learn more about the hellbender on this film than you probably knew about it. I certainly learned a lot, but that's an incredibly interesting critter and uh, students, are the ones that got it named the state amphibian. So again, you might see a river otter. I've seen them uh, in the Susquehanna in front of Harrisburg and those islands. You certainly can see an osprey if you spend a little bit of time out there. So again, I'll just leave you with this challenge. Um, you know, nature has a lot to offer. Your local parks and state parks are a great place to begin. And uh, the more we can all learn, then the more we'll be motivated to do some things to clean up Chesapeake Bay, because it's really gonna take all of us. It takes a huge partnership and includes, uh, includes you, and especially the students, because uh, given your age, you have uh, decades, decades ahead of you where you can make a huge difference. So thank you for watching the film and participating in this panel discussion. So with that, I'm, uh, I'll be eager to hear your questions. Absolutely. Uh, Secretary Dunn, thank you so much. Yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you to all our speakers. Well, let's ask some questions. Dr. Haynes, Michael, I feel like we should speak with you since you produced the movie. Um, given that you wanted to film the feature, you wanted to feature the Chesapeake Bay and its massive watershed, how did you decide which stories to tell and what to include in this film? Well, that was a real challenge uh, from the very beginning. Uh, the first thing we did was we spent uh, uh, the better part of three years doing research on what are the issues, what are the problems, what do we need to know, what are the facts, uh, what has the evidence told us about the health of the bay and the health of the watershed. Um, and at Whitaker Center, we had three science educators working on this task um, over the course of three years, um, putting together all the background information we needed to know. The second thing was to think about the audience. Uh, our audience for this film really is uh, the elementary age student and the secondary age, the secondary school student. Um, students are the ones that we focus the film on because they're the ones who can make the biggest difference in the future. And then thirdly, um, it, we needed to put together a diverse group of advisors. Um, everyone has an opinion about Chesapeake Bay and what needs to be done. So we felt the best thing to do was to bring those people into the same room and to have a series of meetings and talk about this. And so over the course of the entire eight years that we worked on this film, we had a group of educators, researchers, policymakers, advocates, um, just inter interested citizens who met with us on a regular basis and advised us on every step of the project. Now, that group eventually grew to about 35 people because every time we heard from someone who said, I'd like to be involved, we said, would you join the advisory group and meet with us? We want people to have the voice in, in creating this film. So those were the main components in really deciding what should happen and uh, what should be included in the film. Yeah. Fantastic. Secretary Dunn, you know, we don't live on the Chesapeake Bay, but what are some actions that we can take to, to help protect it? And, and why should we care about that since we don't live on the bay? Well, first of all, you gotta, you gotta realize whatever happens on land is what affects water quality. So if, uh, if you go out and, and dump 
paint down a, a storm drain. It's going to end up in a local stream and in Chesapeake Bay. So think about actions you take on land uh, in your everyday life that could affect water. But again, I, planting a tree along a stream, whether uh, your class or whether a club you're with decides to uh, choose a stream and plant some trees, that will help filter the water, help clean the water and shade the water. So you can never go wrong by planting a tree. But um, this winter, you know, you're, you're at, uh, when you're at home and perhaps learning by yourself, just um, Google around, find a Pennsylvania animal that you're interested in, just learn a little bit about it. Because if you um, decide you're gonna learn more about nature and wanna, and you will, believe me, as you get a little closer to it, you'll find it's fascinating. Then that will take you down a path that'll will lead you to really helping protect that, that animal that you may, care about. You notice I have a uh, dragonfly necklace on. These, these are some of my favorite critters. You can see them at Wildwood. You can see them. Um, there's a there's a similar park down near uh, Middletown. I can't think of the name of it. It's in Royalton. But again, a kind of a pond. Uh, learning more about dragonflies taught me that they need clean water. And certainly they want to keep the water clean where these things hatch out of a stream. So Start by learning and, and getting interested in something that, that interests you. Hey, you might decide you want to take up farming. You can make a big difference for water quality as a farmer. Like Joel Rott said, farmers, uh, yeah, the modern farmer is, uh, well, farmers have always been environmentalists. Just read Aldo Leopold, they're stewards of the land. But learn about stewardship of land as a farmer. And um, they, they know their land very well. They know what lives on it and uh, they know how to clean the water. So there's a lot of ways you can get involved. Very good, thank you for that. And Joel, uh, let's ask you, you, you talked about the sins of the past as you put it with agriculture. Um, how did that affect the water quality in the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed? And what do you think farmers need to be doing now, if anything, to further improve what they're doing. Sure. Well, like I mentioned, you know, when in earlier years of farming for, for centuries, actually, um, you know, farmers have always uh, believed that they, and, and they did at that point in time, we didn't have the technology that we do today uh, to farm land without tilling the soil. And so, um, and, and of course, um, putting, uh, nutrients on the soil to help the crops grow. We all need to eat. We all need the farmers. Um, as I mentioned, we have 30,000 farms in this watershed. I don't think I did mention they're producing, you know, like 136 billion and who knows how much money that really is, but 136 billion uh, dollars worth of food uh, here in Chesapeake Bay uh, region. So you can't just tell farmers to go away. Uh, we need the farmers and uh, and the farmers, what they can do, uh, of course, now with the new technologies is both to try to minimize stirring up the, the soil so that the soil can't move when the rains come. And also just to build soil, we, we hear more and more about soil health. Believe it or not, keeping a healthy soil also helps keep the soil where it belongs instead of in the Chesapeake Bay. So that the water can saturate into the soil instead of washing the soil away. So, Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead if you weren't quite finished. I, I just wanted to quickly mention that yep. you know, many of the improvements we've made in the Chesapeake Bay watershed have come through what we call, and I know the adults know this terminology, the kids, the students, not so familiar, but point sources, you know, sources where sewage treatment plants, for instance, you know, when you flush your toilet, that has to go somewhere and that gets treated and the water gets returned eventually uh, back into the watershed. So we've done a lot of improvement with that and, and continue to do with storm water. Uh, so those are point sources, but, but farmland is, is a non-point source. And the challenge we have with non-point sources besides the fact that there's so many places it can enter into the watershed is that we really don't have a good way of paying for the improvements. But like your sewage treatment plants can, can tax the people that flush the toilet, um, pay for those new facilities. How does a farmer pay for uh, 
installing uh, stream bank buffers, like Cindy mentioned earlier, and those types of practices. They take money and farmers have a tough time making ends meet now. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks so much. We've got a couple of great questions here from the fourth grade students at SSES. Um, first, I think maybe Secretary Dunn, if you could answer the first part, which is how can we be stewards? Also, how do we get people to care? Yeah, so I think that you have to think about what's, uh, what's possible for you as an individual. If you're a student and you have a, a backyard or you live near a community park, you can um, certainly get involved in planting and greening up that space. Someone wrote about rain gardens, little, little depressions in the land with special plants planted can help filter off the runoff from that area. Certainly in your backyard or, um, or land that you have access to, you can plant, uh, you know, plant trees, plant shrubbery, plant anything besides grass that really helps filter the, the, uh, filter the water. If, you, um, if your school or a club you're involved with wants to tackle a bigger project, you can uh, you know, seek funding. And there are many organizations that might support your project. You can write letters to get the money. And then you can go out and do a local project. Perhaps it's at a park where you're planting uh, a natural area. Perhaps it's just to help maintain a natural area that some students before you uh, planted. Uh, we've got a lot of streamside buffers that have already been planted. And uh, a lot of time we're looking for volunteers to go out and help really maintain them and clean them up. Very good, thank you, Secretary. Uh, Dr. Haynes and the, the fourth graders at SSES also wanna know what was the hardest part in making this film? <laughs> well, there were a lot of challenges. The summer we were filming from June until August of 2018 was the wettest three summer months on record in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So we were dealing with lots and lots of natural conditions, uh, just trying to get the film made. But I think the most difficult part was getting good footage of river otters. Uh, they're very private individuals and they uh, are hard to find. And once you find them, they're very, very bashful. But if you, can, if you can find them and sort of stay back so they don't see you, they're fascinating to watch. And we, we just really felt it was critical to have good footage of those river otters in the film. Very good, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Joel, let's ask you this one. What makes addressing water quality issues on farms much more challenging than point sources, such as sewage treatment plants and urban runoff? Yeah, and I, I guess I might've gotten a little ahead of myself prior um, with some of the comments, but, but again, I, it, the, the main difference is uh, that you, uh, with non-point source such as farms, you really don't have a good funding mechanism to help pay for the practices that need to be implemented out there uh, without perhaps, you know, just government funding, uh, which is awful difficult to come by, uh, particularly in this day and age of COVID. Uh, so we have a lot of economic challenges to, to meet. Um, with non-point sources versus point. And, um, and of course you're dealing with 30,000 different individuals. Um, you, know, you, you don't just have a, a, you know, several hundred municipalities to deal with. You have 30,000 individuals that have to understand the importance of uh, putting best management practices on their farms. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Janaya Cobb from Harrisburg High SciTech. In the documentary, the decline of the oyster population is mentioned as having a dramatic effect on the natural filtering of the water in the bay. What can be done to improve the oyster population? Uh, Secretary Dunn, I don't know, if, would that go to you? I think everything that we're doing up here in the uh in Pennsylvania for the Bay watershed. And keep in mind, uh, the film mentioned, uh, you know, the 64,000 square mile watershed, 27,500 in Pennsylvania. So what we're actually talking about today and some of the chat box comments really captured some of the ideas, what we can do today to keep sediment and extra nutrients out of the water will help the oyster population. For people who actually live down on the Bay, um, 
some you know some communities are doing oyster bed planting in other words they they'll buy oysters and put them in a basket off a dock nearby for a nearby park or if they own a dock or if they own some shoreline so that actually helps filter filter the water and and keep the oysters uh, reproducing in the bay but again everything we're doing up here in the watershed it is really one big ecosystem and even though we have these so-called political boundaries, like uh, yeah, the Mason-Dixon line between Maryland and Pennsylvania, and the other political lines on on the map, it's really one big ecosystem. You could you could really call the Susquehanna River. We could call the Chesapeake Bay the Susquehanna Bay. It really is the lower end of the Susquehanna River that has become estuarine. Uh, the, the different names and the political boundaries make us think of it as separate, but. What we're doing way up here has has a lot to do with um, bringing back oysters and crabs. And if you haven't <laughs> if you haven't eaten oysters or crabs, I uh, encourage you to give them a shot because that that'll remind you why uh, another reason why it's good to clean up Chesapeake Bay, not just for own local water quality, but for these uh, wonderful resources that are available and, and richness of resources available in our region. And for the fishing industry too, I see a comment from Kevin Bustami from SciTech. He, uh, Kevin says, the states of the Chesapeake Bay rely on fishing as an economical resource mm -hmm. in the documentary. Oyster serves as a crucial role by filtering out the pollution is the decline in the oyster population and the resulting increase in pollution impacting the fishing industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could. I could jump in on that. I mean, okay. yeah, they, they, it's a big, they used to call the Chesapeake the big protein factory. In terms of, mm -hmm. I mentioned food security and how, how good our farmers are doing at keeping us all fed, that the Chesapeake is a tremendous protein factory. It, if you just look at it as a regional and national asset, it's capable of producing, you know, you know fish, oysters, crabs, and numerous other uh, numerous other food sources for for humanity, and in doing so, great economic return. It just needs a chance to um, clean up, you know, clean up the water and really do what it can do naturally, you know, just by giving it a little break on the pollution side. Great question from Tai Win, um, Joel. Maybe you be the one to answer this one. Agricultural runoff is a major contributor to the pollution of the Bay. If regulations are made forcing Pennsylvania to provide stricter pollution control, how would this affect the agricultural economy? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And, and again, if you have only regulation on farmers and no way to assist the farmers in meeting those regulations, and, and let me just tell you the most frustrating thing for farmers is that we, we, we are told how much reduction needs to occur and farmers are trying to, to reach those levels of reduction. And, and then we get new information that says, well, guess what? We got to reduce even more. Um, and after a while, farmers kind of throw up their hands and say, you know, I'm never going to achieve this. And how am I going to achieve that? But yeah, if you have just regulation, what you can do is run farmers out of business. And uh, that's not good for the Chesapeake Bay region either, as I've already pointed out. Uh, we need these farms to feed us. We need these farms because they bring jobs. I don't think I mentioned over 600,000 jobs created by the agriculture that's in this region, uh, direct jobs, and then uh, and probably a million more related. So, um, there, there's costs and benefit to, to everything we're weighing here on uh, how we can best address the, uh, the Bay issue. So I would just plead, yes, regulation is, is happening and will continue to happen, but we also need uh, something other than a stick. We need the carrots and uh, farmers will respond to carrots. <laughs> yeah, that, so, yep. I was just gonna say it's a tricky balance, Secretary Dunn. Yeah, farmers. We calculated DEP calculated the amount of money needed uh, for farmers. It's, it's, it's three hundred million dollars or, or more per year. per year. She froze up on us per the year. Farmers oh, is, is actually for the environment. You've got hardworking people managing land and willing to manage it right, and so they just need the tools and the resources and the best management practices to be able to do that. If those farmers quit and leave that land, then what's what's going to happen? It's 
probably going to become covered with cement and concrete and be, you know, more runoff. So we need to enable them to be the stores of that land because they have the streams running through the farms. They've got the ability to plant the trees. They've got the ability to reduce the runoff. It just it's going to take a lot of money and, and political will. And don't underestimate, you know, students writing to legislators asking for uh, money for their future can be very effective. Uh, students do it all the time. Again, I mentioned the, uh, the hellbender, a sweet, Swedish student, Greta Thunberg, uh, made a big request on climate change that was heard by the world. So um, don't, don't underestimate uh, your voice, even if you're very young. Another great question from SciTech, uh, from Alana Myers. There are features designed to reduce the accumulation of rainwater and runoff. Is it feasible to promote and or subsidize the construction of rain gardens, the preservation of trees and plants along the riverfronts, and create more permeable types of driveways or patios? Mm -hmm. At least do you want me to just- Yeah, I think so, I, yes. I feel like I'm talking a lot, but yeah, yeah. We, we do fund that. Actually, we uh, local governments apply for funding and, uh, and get money from DCNR through our grants program. DEP has growing greener grants. DEP also provides funding for that. Uh, in terms of uh, the other practices were mentioned, um, it is happening on private lands uh, through private dollars uh, all over the place as well. And sometimes, you know, voluntarily, there's, there's legions of volunteers out there doing good on the ground work across our watersheds. It sometimes it makes sense to organize um, I first met uh, John Warfield and his wife in, in uh, a local watershed group. It pays to organize by watershed. And I, I'm part of the Connor the Gwinnett Creek watershed organization, but there's a Yellow Breaches one. There's, uh, there's a, there used to be a Paxson Creek watershed group. So organizing yourself in some other, um, you know, some watershed level uh, really allows you to focus in on that watershed, get some things done, raise some money and do the good work. Thank you. I like this question. It came from Tide K. I'm hope, I hope I'm saying this correctly. Dr. Haynes, I don't know if you learned this making your movie, but Tide wants to know how far can an osprey fly without taking any breaks? I don't know if we know the answer to that, but I like that question. It's a great question. In fact, it's a, it's a fascinating question. I honestly don't know the exact number of miles, but I can tell you that the, as the film indicates, the osprey that uh, summer on the Chesapeake Bay will, many of them fly all the way to South America for the winter months. So that gives you some idea of the dis total distance they can fly. And uh, what is fascinating about that migration is that they don't fly in flocks, they fly as individual, individual birds. And when they return, they return to the same nest and so it's, uh, it's interesting animal behavior on the part of the osprey. Uh, so they, they can fly long distance, very long distances, but how far in the course of a day, I'm not quite sure. Okay, oh, there's so many great questions. So many John, questions. Should I, should I throw out another one or should we begin to wrap? It's up to you. Well, put out one more if you could and, and okay. then, we'll, then we'll start bringing it in for a landing. Here's one from, from Heather Barton from SSES. How many rivers and streams flow into the Chesapeake? What are the names of a few? Secretary Dunn, do we go to you again for well, that? I don't know if you know. Yeah, the Susquehanna is the big one. We provide half of the fresh water to the bay, so we're 50%. The next biggest is the Potomac. It goes through Washington, D.C. Uh, boy, third biggest, I believe, are uh, Rappahannock and Patuxent, uh, some of the eastern shore rivers like the Chester and uh, Mattapanai, and so I thought, no, sorry, that's what, that's Virginia. Uh, the James, oh, the James is number three. The James River through Richmond is number three. Here locally, uh, the, the creeks and rivers from the Connor de Gwinnett and Yellow Breaches on the west shore to the Paxton Creek uh, on the east shore, you know, Fishing Creek north of there. Uh, there's a few of the streams that down below us in Lancaster County, the Cadores. Um, and the course is on York side, the uh, Conestoga on the Lancaster side. Conestoga, incidentally, in the Lancaster side has one of the highest nutrient loads 
um, of all the streams in Pennsylvania. Then all those little streams that flow through individual properties are going to the bay as well. So that smallest little stream, some of them don't even have names, are just as important. Thank you, Secretary. Secretary Dunn. Dunn. Yeah. I think I read and I was just seeing if she could confirm. I thought I saw something in recently that just here in the chest in the Susquehanna watershed, we have something like eleven thousand uh, streams and tributaries. That yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. We have sixty three thousand miles of streams and rivers in Pennsylvania. You know, half of them are in the Bay Watershed. Um, I guess some of them don't even have names. Some of them, some of them have uh, you know crazy names. You know, from way way back in the pioneer times. So yes, so they're everywhere. Every every inch of land is in a watershed. That water, you you drop a you know you pour a glass of water on land anywhere, it's going towards a stream. Great information today. I, I first, I want to applaud the students for your amazing questions. Absolutely. Your, Let's give a big Harrisburg Rotary yep. Club applause for the students. Mm -hmm. You guys were just great. I saw you concentrating and watching and participating. And uh, first of all, it's a great topic. I can see why you're interested. So thank you to the students for being here. Secretary Dunn, thank you for your knowledge and your insight. Dr. Haynes, thank you for making this amazing movie and for your presentation and information. And Joel Rotz from the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, thank you so much for your insight. And, and I thank think you to too, thank Alicia, you. Alicia, and yeah. all the oh, folks yes. over at ABC 27. Thanks for being here with us today. Um, okay. We are, you know, we are two minutes away from our hard stop time at one o'clock. Thanks again to everyone, really, for the great program today. For follow up, you know, Rotary has seven areas of focus, two of which are water and sanitation and supporting the, vir the environment. So if anyone here today would like to learn more about the Rotary Club of Harrisburg Ecology Committee and some of the good work that our club members are doing in that area, make sure you reach out to Adeline, uh, John Moorfield. Uh, we can help to point you in the right direction. Um, and we appreciate all the good folks who work on our Ecology Committee, as well as some of the uh, district folks, Rotary District 7390. So again, thanks to everyone for being here today. Thank you to the students. And uh, next week, uh, remember, is our four-way test speech contest. So we'll be hearing from students talking about how they apply the Rotary four-way test in real everyday life contexts. Wow, the hour just went right by, right? Again, it's so difficult to thank people properly in a Zoom meeting, but thank you again. We appreciate you all and make it a great Rotary Week. Mm -hmm.